want to be recorded. There you are. Um, uh, we're, because of the number of people, uh, we're going to mute you during most of the time. Uh, so I'd ask that you go down to the bottom screen, you go to chat and uh, enter any questions during the talks um, uh, as the, the simplest and best way to, uh, to ask the questions. We're also further down the line going to be asked about suggestions for uh, topics and themes for um, the conference in, at this time next year. Um, but I want to take the opportunity, first of all, to introduce uh, Simon, Simon Thorpe, to just say a few words on behalf of EWWF before we get started. Over to you, Simon. Jim, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon to everyone. Yes, I'm speaking as chairman of the England and Wales Welfare Forum, the EWWF, but I'm also speaking on behalf of Bru Farkerson, chair of the Scottish Welfare Forum, who's also on the call and will speak a bit later on, I think. First, really, it's thanks to Belfast team for setting up this webinar in place of the postponed uh, conference. It's a very useful opportunity to get everyone together at this stage. With regard to the welfare forums, it's the Scottish forum has been in place the longest since about 2005 and the England Wales welfare forum followed. And what we're about is, as far as the forums is concerned, is really trying to represent the interests of a very so wide cross-sector welfare community, raising the profile of wildfire and developing consensus about how to say plan and prepare for wildfire events and respond to wildfire incidents. So it's, it's the full range of wildfire issues. And as part of this, the wildfire conferences, they started way back in 2003 and have run regularly since about sort of every other year. So I think importantly, the wildfire forums took over the coordination of these conferences starting with a conference run by uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service at Canvas Lang, uh, just outside Glasgow in 2015. Um, they've been followed by conferences at Bournemouth, Cardiff, and now we're building up for Belfast. I think, as, as Jim has alluded to, one of the aims of today really is to gather ideas around the proposed theme of the human dimension for the conference next year. And as Jim suggested, use a chat to give us some ideas as we go through, and uh, there'll be that discussion later in the program. <coughs> And really just to say that both forums are very keen to support next year's conference. We see the conference as being an important output for everybody involved in wildfire in the UK. Bruce is going to lead on some thoughts about the topics for next year's conference when we get to that part of the agenda. Uh, and I think that'll hopefully spur us on to come up with really a successful mix for next year's conference. Um, and I very much look forward to being in Belfast. Right, back to Jim. Thank you very much. And I just want to move on to finally to introduce Colm, Colm McDade. He's the Senior Scientific Officer with the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and is their main lead as far as wildfire is concerned. So over to you, Colm. Yes, uh, on behalf of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, I'd like to welcome you all here this, this afternoon or this evening, depending where you where you are in the world. Um, it, it, it's a pleasant surprise to see such an interest uh, and such a good turnout from across the UK and Europe and, and, and further afield. And, um, we would look, I would have liked to have been seeing you here uh, today in person, but obviously uh, circumstances dictate otherwise. And I really hope that we can get um, a bit of feedback from all of you either <clears throat> During the during the uh, webinar today, or even afterwards by email, uh, on any uh, follow up suggestions on themes that that maybe we want to incorporate in, in next year's conference, um, all I'll say is look, uh, I hope you find it interesting. I know that it's been a bit of a challenge to get a wide range of uh, speakers and topics, and the topics on the face look very interesting, and I'll certainly. Be looking forward to listening to, to the speakers and see what, what else I can learn up uh, from tonight. And um, I just say thank you all again for attending this afternoon or this evening. And Jim. Thanks very much, Colm. Um, listen, it'll be uh, my job now to uh, introduce the uh, speakers. I'll keep that fairly short and sweet. And I'll also be uh, giving the speakers a gentle reminder about time. Um, we um, uh, asked 
uh, the speakers to come back to us about what lessons the summer of 2021 has taught us, really because we haven't met uh, in this sort of format for a good while. It's also the summer of 2020, as well as uh, 2021 or the season, those two seasons. Uh, I'll go straight in a minute early, believe it or not. Uh, I would ask David Swallow uh, to give the first presentation. David uh, uh, worked for the Hereford and Worcester Fire and Rescue Service and is also the lead wildfire tactical advisor. So uh, Dave, over to yourself. Here's Jim, thank you. Uh, give me two texts, I'll just share my screen. You'll be able to share, share yeah. That's great. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, brief introduction from Jim there. So, uh, I'm Dave Swallow. I just started with Hereford and Worcester Fire and Rescue Service, having done 20 years with Greater Manchester previously. Um, and as he said, I'm also the uh, National Fire Chiefs Council lead uh, tactical advisor. Um, that is uh, really just a role that, um, as a coordinating role, really, to help support Paul Headley as the NFCC lead for wildfire, uh, coordinate the group of tactical advisors. Um, in terms of a attack had group as well, um, this year, uh, 2021, that is, has been um, a relatively quiet one, but, um, and we've had no uh, national mobilizations. Uh, that said, we've still had a number of uh, significant number of wildfires across the UK, which is uh, what I'm going to sort of lead into. Uh, so, what uh, I thought I'd just give a brief introduction to the um, to the TAC ads. Excuse me, let me just move my uh, this screen around a little bit there. So, uh, just give a brief introduction to the uh, the TAC ads in general, because uh, I'm aware we've got a broad spectrum of people from around the world, so they're not too familiar with uh, the TAC ads as, as, a, as a capability, really. Um, so, firstly, um, our kind of definitions of um, wildfire here in the UK, um, it's a... This is what is pulled from our national operational guidance for fire services for uh, England and Wales, particularly that uh, any uncontrolled vegetation fire which requires incision action or regarding suppression. Um, that's a little bit um, not bland, really. I don't think it's the right word, but it's a bit open that, uh, you know, because that could be anything from a, a very small grass fire that requires very little intervention. Um, to something very large and significant resulting in a major incident, obviously. So within our national operational guidance um, and the stuff that we work to for reporting mechanisms, more importantly, is um, the second definition there of uh, anything greater than a hectare, sustained flame length of one and a half metres, requires a committed resource of four or more appliances or resources, um, needs them to commit, be committed for more than six hours or presents a serious threat to life, environment, property and infrastructure. Um, that, that obviously leads itself to the wildfires that we're talking about and the ones that get recorded being something more significant than, you know, the thousands and thousands of smaller incidents of the fire service and others deal with um, daily at certain parts of the year, um, many of which don't, don't even get formally recorded within our uh, incident recording system um, and that that definition uh, with that list of being any one of them meeting any one of them criteria is quite important to us nationally in seeing where we're at with um, in terms of recording and where we're at with the number of incidents we're dealing with each year um, and it's starting to build that evidence base and it's some of that that I'm going to talk about now um, <clears throat> so like I say, that recording, it just um, identifies the significant uh, wildfires that we deal with. So as a TACAD capability then, uh, we've been around about five years. Um, first deployed to Saddleworth Moor back in 2018 and then quickly onto Winter Hill, uh, both in Greater Manchester or on the borders of Greater Manchester um, and Winter Hill with Lancashire and Saddleworth Moor bordering into Derbyshire as well. Um, those two incidents, both declared major incidents, uh, attracted uh, definitely national interest and resources from right across the country uh, to support Greater Manchester in dealing with them. And, um, you know, probably international media as well, to some degree. 
the TACAD capability is an un unfunded capability as it currently stands. It's so that that's what the best endeavors part is about. It's a group of currently 47 individuals who have all um, got a significant amount of experience with dealing with wildfires within their own services and have done a number of courses that uh, has led up to a TACAD training course. Um, and then they can be put on the rotor, so to speak. Uh, Apologise, this this is a little bit out of date. We do have 47 now. We have dropped from 50. We did a training course earlier this year, which was online. It's yet to be completed. Um, as I said, the lead wildfire, the, well, the wildfire lead for the NFCC is the uh, Chief of Northumberland, Paul Headley. Um, and Northumberland, uh, as a service, generally leads on the, the TACAD training. Uh, we hold regular CPD events. In fact, um, we've just had a couple that South Wales, Craig Cope and his team have put on for us, um, looking at the use of fire, because we identified that was a gap in a lot of, uh, of our TACADS knowledge and understanding. Um, and in 2020, um, we had 13 major wildfire events and um, mobilised 19 TACADS uh, to a number of them, including the Hatfield, Moor, Wareham Forest, um, and South Yorkshire incidents, and they were sustained wildfires over a number of weeks. Um, and we had to, you know, we deployed TACADs to them incidents and then relieved them after a few days on a rolling process. So, where are we at at the moment? So, the things that we've kind of picked up over the last few years is we've had mobilizations in 2018, 19, and 20, um, is some of the background support. As a group of TAC ads um, and that best endeavours effort not being uh, financially supported uh, through central government and relying on local services just to support their individual TAC ads with um, allowing them to be released for training or to attend incidents and providing them with equipment. Um, we've, we identified a bit of a, um, an issue potentially with mobilisation. And so we've currently got the support of um, National Resilience who hold uh, responsibility and funding for all our national assets that um, various services have, like the high volume pumps and the um, mass decontamination stuff. National Resilience have um, supported us in allowing us to register the TAC ads within their emergency um, support system so that we can see TAC ad availability and mobilize the, uh, the TAC ads through that system. So now we've got a process in place um, with a developed concept of operations document that uh, if a service is, uh, needs a require, requires the, um, a TAC ad to attend an incident because they're dealing with significant wildfire and they want that advice, that, that, services, that fire services control room can phone the National Resilience Fire Control and they'll do the arrangements with the, the National Resilience Assurance team and myself to mobilise the appropriate um, TAC ads to the incident. Um, unfortunately, national resilience only sit over resources in England and Wales, but they do have links in with uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland because of our 47 tactical advisors, uh, a large number of them are based in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, as a group of TACADs, there's that agreement, I suppose, to, suppose is the best way to put it, that we're happy to cross them borders We've not actually had to test that yet. Um, and Scotland and Northern Ireland have not required assistance from English and Welsh um, TACADs and uh, vice versa. Uh, we haven't reached that point. So that's yet to be tested, but um, National Resilience as a, as a coordinating asset confirmed that um, they have similar, similar arrangements for Scotland and Northern Ireland. And if they needed to, um, if we needed support from their TAC ads, they would do that through the national resilience arrangements in terms of contacting them control rooms um, to get that support and vice versa should, should they need our support from England and Wales as well. Um, so that's important that we have national resilience as um, on board with supporting us in this way because they've also allowed us to record incidents through the national reporting tool and that's what's allowing us to build up them figures um, at the bottom for the various years. Uh, again, as a national, as a reporting tool, it's only applicable to England and Wales. And, and we're all, you know, many of us will be well aware that uh, Scotland and 
um, Northern Ireland are having, you know, similar numbers of fires as well. But um, and it looks quite dramatic that from 2018 to 2021, uh, considering we've had no mobilisations. But it's actually um, through the work of the, the TACAD groups in the various services across the country, um, the support of the NFCC wildfire group and the, and, and the broad number of stakeholders that are involved in that. Um, we're improving that reporting mechanism. So we're improving control rooms, individual fire control rooms, reporting into the national reporting tool that gives us a more broader picture nationally of the, the number of incidents we're attending. Um, and that's, uh, that's important because that's starting to build the business case for um, the TACADs becoming, um, developing into potentially a funded asset at some point in the future. Um, there's a bit of a review going on at the moment um, nationally around the uh, the national resilience assets and there's a there's two or three unfunded capabilities should we say like the wildfire attack ads and the waste fire attack ads that uh, sit outside of national resilience um, funding and agreements directly although they get the support through national resilience and so this um, build up of evidence that we've got about the number of incidents that um, is happening across the country and the support and the importance of the TAC ads and other wildfire assets that are available um, is just dead, you know, is important to build that business case that the, there is an issue, there is a significant risk and, um, you know, we've got some assets in place to deal with it, but these assets could be far better and um, far more effective if they were uh, appropriately funded and what have you. So although, like I say, although those figures between 2018 and 2021 look quite dramatic, it's probably only, you know, we're still not getting every fire service reporting incidents into the national reporting tool like they should do. Um, there's, some, so there's a number of services that haven't got TAC ads and so don't get that support or that prompt from the TAC ads when incidents happen um, to prompt that reporting. But it's something that, um, myself and I know a number of others do uh, when they pick up on incidents through social media or other outlets will uh, will give them services a bit of a nudge just to make sure that things get reported properly um, because that information that we're getting and that recording does highlight some changes that we're starting to see across the country so um, you know anecdotally previously our wildfire season was very spring um orientated with some summer wildfires um depending on uh how the summer panned out generally if it, if it was dry and warm enough then we'd start to see some summer wildfires but um from the reporting we're getting um we're starting to see that um wildfire season broadening quite a bit and we're now you know quite regularly seeing um from this report and the evidence there that we're getting fires from february right through to november so that wildfire season, as it's being seen elsewhere, excuse me, as we're seeing elsewhere around the world, um, our, our wildfire season is extended, um, you know, earlier into the year and later into the year as well. Um, and I think that's, you know, that was probably demonstrated best earlier this year, um, if that week in February, uh, there we had the, the dry easterlies coming in for a week or so. And we got um, a number of large wildfires right up the west of the country, um, Devon, Wales, Cumbria, right up to Scotland and Northern Ireland, you know, all had significant wildfires, all uh, occurred within a few days of each other while we were getting those weather patterns coming in. Um, and I think that, you know, the recognising of those weather patterns and when they're going to happen is, uh, you know, probably going to be one of our biggest triggers in future um, for increasing that risk of um, of when we're likely to get fires. Um, so <clears throat> I have tried to line these up a little as best I could so that they, they kind of match um, as to where we're at. And each, each colored line within each year. So start with 2018 at the top in blue, going down through 2019, 20 and 21. Um, each one of them lines is, the, is a, an incident that was reported. So that information doesn't tell us how long those incidents went on for or anything like that but they do tell us the start date of the uh, of the incident um and so you can start to see um patterns building up there's still quite obviously um you know through the last three years a clear spring pattern april april and may you know a large number of fires 
Um, but you can also see grouping through the summer, particularly in 2018, 20 and 21, we've got groupings in June, July and August. Um, but like I say, more importantly, we're starting to get them uh, incidents being recorded at the either end of the that spectrum of the year, really, you know, from as early as the 1st of February in 2018. We had a group in uh, early 2019, middle of February, middle to end of February again, where we had dry weather patterns coming in, um, you know, and the same this year in February. And um, again, you know, at the back end of the year, we're going as late as November. The, you know, the other years are well into September. And this year, you know, we've got one as late as 11th of October, which I think uh, from the data I got, um, was only dated up to about the middle of October anyway. I haven't got the last couple of weeks. I'm not aware of anything happening in the last couple of weeks, but it just shows how that season is being extended beyond the traditional spring and summer fires that we're used to, really. Um, so I suppose the important bit is, uh, you know, great, we've got all that information, but what are we what are we doing about it? Um, you know, as a group of TAC ads, why is that, you know, surely there's something to be done there so our tack ads are a, a large number of our tack ads if not all of them are are linked in with local partners in developing local response plans and uh, you know uh, risk assessments and understanding vegetation types um, and a number of them also uh, a number of us also um, linked nationally and internationally with partners um, to, to broaden our understanding uh, and do that um, you know, we've worked on uh, last year uh, because of COVID, we've moved to online CPD events. So we ran uh, four, I think it was in the end, two hour CPD events for our TAC ads through Teams. Um, and, you know, we've asked specialists to provide us a bit of information, you know, give us presentations and looking at um, remote sense, you know, remote monitoring via satellites, um, understanding of weather patterns. We've had a look at um, a couple of us have delivered packages on um, learning from specific wildfire events. Uh, you know, so we're doing what we can to improve our understanding, particularly around the weather and how that's affecting. Um, we've got, uh, you know, as a wildfire group, support the work of the AFAM project. And I think the future of the TAC ads is that we'll we'll try and develop a group within the um, within the 47 that can become that can reach an analyst status uh, based on the outcomes of the AFAM project, really, um, so that we can provide that support, uh, remote support um, around the prediction and understanding of what is likely to happen uh, when we do get fires, and understanding when we, you know, when that risk is increased, we start to do that work as well, so that we can uh, have a greater risk awareness and be more prepared. Um, and potentially even prepare local uh, local resilience forums or local partners within certain areas of the country. Um, so they start to stand up resources or think about standing up resources um, more effectively. Um, we got a number of TAC ads who are supporting the, um, the UK fire danger rates uh, system that's being developed uh, by Exeter and a number of other universities. Um, and I suppose the big one really is that um, Overall, we're looking to further embed the uh, capability with national resilience to get that proper effective national support that's required. Um, I like to say I'd like to be able to offer or receive support from Scotland and Northern Ireland in future. As a group of TAC ads, we all work together and uh, are working to the same skill set, but we've just not had that uh, cross-border um, need at the moment and, I th and there could potentially be um, some political issues with doing that with the uh, with the way our devolved um, devolved countries works within the UK um, aside from that more locally I mean like I said Jim the you asked me to talk about what we've learned from wildfires this year and as we've not had any deployments this year um, the learning has been limited, which is why I focused on um, the recording of the, the recording of fires that we've had over the last few years and how how we're starting to develop from that really. Um, but as a as a group specifically, you know, there's was loads of learning taken from the incidents that we we had last year. 
um, you know, from things that are as basic as we send, we try and send three TACADs to an incident rather than two, so that we've got that support for an incident commander whilst we're also gathering information out on the ground, um, you know, <clears throat> how the structure of a mobilization works and, um, you know, which has led to review of our concept of operations and stuff like that. So there's loads of bits of work going on in the background, but I think um, I just thought it was more important probably to highlight some of the the national and international work that the the TACADs are supporting and involved with, really. And that's it. So I'm happy to take some questions if now's the time. Yeah, Dave, uh, Noel Rice here. We've one question from the chat room. Uh, is the increase in wildfire numbers due to better awareness of the reporting mechanism? Um, Yes, I think it probably is. Yeah, I don't think that we just dealt with the, was it 68 or something in um, yeah. in 2018? You know, we've been dealing with hundreds, if not, well, definitely hundreds of significant wildfires every year um, for years, really. But the, uh, it is just that improved reporting, uh, a better awareness of that reporting tool at a national level that's, um, that's led to that, yeah. <clears throat> there are no more there are no more questions in the in the uh, chat room but if anyone would like to uh, ask a question of dave you could they can make themselves known by raising their hand on the reactions icon at the bottom yeah mark mark hammond hi uh just dave one just quick question is in Relation to the TAC ads, is there any link with the Republic of Ireland or any other international uh, agencies or partners? Um, there will be somewhere. I'd be surprised if our, some of our Northern Ireland TAC ads don't have links with uh, Republic of Ireland colleagues. Um, I'm not aware of any personally. Um, I am aware that you know a number of our TAC ads are linked with um, colleagues in the US and across Europe. Um, and Australia and stuff like that. Some of the, you know, some of those traditional large, um, large sort of wildfire countries, so to speak, um, because we're taking a lot of, a lot of what we're doing, a lot of learning from them, really. Um, but you know, we've been more than happy to start building relationships with, with uh, colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, without a doubt. Okay, uh, Mark. Um, do you have a question from John Pretty? Uh, yeah, hi there. It was just related to the first uh, question and answer, um, the increase in wildfire numbers due to better awareness. Um, can the same be said for that um, broadening of the, uh, you know, the, the, the time uh, for the wildfires, the February and the November? Is that down to better reporting as well? Um, do you know what, John? I think that that's probably difficult. Um, it's difficult to say yes or no to that, to be honest, because um, because previous reporting probably wasn't that good. Um, I would say from personal experience and the experience of others, um, it, it was never usual to have fires as early as February or as late as November. I'm not saying they never happened, but um, it probably wasn't that usual. Um, I think that probably the importance or the important part of... Um, that's kind of missing out with some of that information within the recording is the size of the fires uh, and the size that they, they end up before they're controlled really um and whether there's much how much change there is with that because um you know we'd all say that generally fires um particularly in certain weather patterns are more difficult to deal with um and beyond traditional methods of extinction within the uk um and so generally they get a bit bigger or they get more deep seated than they were previously. But um, in terms of where we're at with the spectrum, I think we're probably going to need a good few years worth of reporting before we can definitely say where we were at previously and where it's going or see a pattern of where it's going, if that makes sense. Okay, okay Mark. Okay, uh, yeah, thank Mark, you. Uh, just before we finish questions, we have one more question in the chat room from Tia Crouch, who's asked, uh, how are the TAC ads currently funded? So, like I said, uh, as our own best endeavours um, group, 
the the TACA, each um, tactical advisor is sort of individually supported by their own service. So it's um, within the concept of operations, we do have sort of a list of criteria that we ask the services to, um, to kind of sign up to. Uh, you've got to have the support of your chief officer before you can be nominated as a TACAD, as well as um, a background in wildfire, you know, having completed a, an advanced training course, for example, so you've got a good understanding and what have you. But um, yeah, as it, as it stands, it's just funded locally through each individual okay. service. Okay, well, th there are no more questions, but just a comment from Mark Smith, who's confirmed that uh, in Northern Ireland here, we have good connections with Dublin, Cavan, Monaghan and Kerry fire services in the Republic of Ireland. So uh, just hand you back now to, to Jim Bradley. Okay. Listen, um, thank you very much again, David. Um, we do have a, a little bit of time that I need to catch up on. So if uh, we, we could move on here, if Craig, if you're ready to roll with your uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Craig is the, put some down, uh, is the station manager with the South Wales Fire and Rescue Service. Those of you who've been to previous conferences, et cetera, will have, will have seen some of his talks, particularly on the uh, wildfire toolkit, et cetera. But Craig's going to talk uh, as well as, as on the toolkit on this deployment to Greece this summer. So over to yourself, Craig. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. So uh, I've been asked to give a quick presentation on the UK Fire and Rescue Service deployment to Greece in August 2021. So. I thought before before I do that, I'd introduce myself and introduce some of the reasons why why we went and what we then what we achieved when we were there. So as Jim just said, my name's Craig Hope. I'm a station commander in the South Wales Valleys. I manage two fire stations. I'm also a wildfire instructor for South Wales Fire and Rescue Service. So we have a team of eight instructors who lead on the training and and we also then, as you can see, I'm a UK wildfire tactical advisor, and these instructors then also assist with UK-wide training and everything. So we, we try to embed and, and learn and make lessons learned all the time. Uh, I have a role within the NFCC, which I'm the tactical fire use and aerial firefighting lead. And I'm also a partner at the EU AVAN project, which is all about building a framework for fire analysis. So there's lots of countries in Europe doing, doing some really good things, but doing different things. And this is about bringing everything together so we understand and then we can move forward. So hopefully the, the UK Fire and Rescue Service can move forward with this because it's, it's a, again, it's another impart, important part of the jigsaw. I'm also at the, at the end of an MSc at uh, Swans University, which is looking at perceptions of risk from wildfire, again, in the South Wales Valleys, using communities and also stakeholders. So again, I'm quite busy when it comes to, to wildfire and my role as a system commander. So wildfire in Wales, so again, uh, when we talk about wildfire in Wales, this is what people think of. I'm lucky enough, I've travelled, I've been about a bit, and we do get a lot of flooding. Uh, we do get a lot uh, of lot of um, rainfall in the South Wales Valleys. But what that does as well, and it leads to, obviously, deluges of water, but in, in short, so specific times, we also then have dry springs and now moving into sort of drier summers and uh, that's a risk within itself but the reality of the fires is somewhat different so again this is a photo from 2021 this is a typical fire in the south wales valleys which luckily because of our traditional stone built houses and luckily in this case you can see the sheds in the garden are actually built of brick they're not traditional wooden sheds so the fires don't generally spread the houses but luckily we did stop this fire in the back gardens and again, um, numbers of numbers, numbers of fires, you have to be careful when you talk about numbers and then you start talking about area burnt. It's more to do with the effects of these fires, but we can get on to that. So again, you can see there, we've had 75, over 75,000 wildfires across South Wales since 2000. And that's not a geographically large area. And, uh, but again, like what Dave also alluded to, these are not all National Operational Guidance, wildfires, these could be small fires, like a large campfire in open ground on the mountainside, or these could be a thousand hectare fire on, in, within the Bretton Beacons National Park. So they are all different. But what we are finding, the more we drive down ignitions through 
community safety work that we've been doing and education, we are finding the fires are getting larger and they're burning for longer. So again, the reasons for this, and this is a worldwide problem. I have looked at this, have studied it, and I'm trying to get an understanding. And this is why we all need to work together. We've got to get out of our silos and we've got to look at what other people are doing and then pick the good bits to make them work for what we are trying to do. And again, how do you try to fight fire? The worse it gets when it does happen, and that is so true. And why? Well, in the South Wales Valleys, we are seeing less fires. So less fires lead to more vegetation, less grazing animals. Now, there are still plenty of sheep in the South Wales Valleys, but they're not on the uplands where they used to be. They're more in paddocks, in fields, and uh, they're not grazing like they used to. Land management of practice have changed, and uh, the amount of the way the trees are harvested and the brass has led to more vegetation. As, as a fire rescue service, we, we've moved from uh, using fire beaters in structural fire kit to really moved on to having ATV vehicles to use fire as a tool and all of these. And the more effective we get, obviously the more vegetation we leave behind. So that's something else we have to consider as well. And then climate change. And again, it's the, that longer growing season will cause us more problems. Um, and it's very interesting, Mark Castellano, who most of you are probably aware of, is a Catalonian fire officer. And he, is, he spoke about that Portugal is seen as the fire capital of Europe because of their, their long, they get the, the warm, wet winters and then the long, dry summers. And when you look at our climate prediction, that's very similar to what they say we are going to have in, in 30 to 50 years' time. So again, now's the time to act, not, not wait for it to happen and then be reactive. So as um, Jim said, we have developed this welfare toolbox, which is all about it's a year-round solution to a seasonal problem because that is the problem in the UK and probably most of Northern Europe is wildfire is, it's not constant. It doesn't start on the 1st of March and end on the, on the 30th of September. It's, a con, it's sporadic and that's the problem. But again, year-round solutions. And then these focus on prevention, education and response. And underneath them, we've got, so the new resources, which we can call upon, burn teams, heavy machinery, actually using bulldozers now which which hasn't happened in the past in in the valleys we have a helicopter we are very fortunate that we have a helicopter on standby all through the summer and and then again some of the tactics then have changed so we and always constantly moving on looking at managed wildfire where when we have these fires burning instead of rushing to put them out because we now have a better understanding of what the fire is doing and the fire's relationship to the landscape we can then allow certain fires to burn when we know that they're not really causing ecological damage. Yes, they're burning vegetation, but if they're not burning into the peat or they're not destroying the trees, etc., we can allow some of these fires and then we can, we can manage them differently. And it's, these are all important things that we need to work together and learn. So again, and, and by using this toolbox, what we have done is we've moved from us all being, we were all, all these partnerships, all the organizations were all, there's somebody's um, microphone still on. Um, in the past, we were, we were all on the same ship, all moving in the same direction, but all in our little boxes, all with different agendas, different ideas. And now we're, we're all on the ship together, cruise ship together, all right, it's not a partnership you can see in the photo, and we do still have different ideas, but it's really important that we're all on this journey together, and that's in South Wales, that's across Wales, that's nationally, and then internationally. We have this greater understanding, and we all move forward together. And this is what we've, we've achieved. So within South Wales, we've moved from firefighters, we're in structural fire kit, using structural fire engines, with just uh, a beater, really, which is a stick with a bit of rubber on the end, to use in these internationally recognized techniques such as fire, ATVs, lightweight fire kits. And, and we've moved on significantly. And again, we are, and we, we're still doing this, but we're evolving from firefighters to fire managers. And that's really important. And it is, it's working really well for us. And that's what we're trying to share with other services as well. And, and finally, on the introduction side of it is again, uh, this is a Stephen Pine um, comment out of one of his, he's written some fantastic books on wildfire, the topic of wildfire, from his time as a wildland firefighter to the actual science behind it all. But this is really important, is that the, the fire and rescue services, we are very good at reducing risk. We're really good at 
at reducing the numbers of road traffic accidents, the numbers of house fires, and all of these problems. The problem is when you use the same techniques to, to deal with wildfire by stopping people igniting fires. Yes, stopping people igniting fires will reduce the risk, but only in the short term. As climate changes and we move into an era of maybe dry lightning or we have accidental wildfires, then all this vegetation is still going to be there. So again, fire exclusion, it's really important that we don't get drawn into the wrong the wrong route, really. But again, these are all up for debate and we need to work together and understand them. So moving on to the, um, the Greek deployment. So on the um, 6th of August, a request was made from the, uh, I believe that um, it came from the Greek government looking for assistance and, um, and, a, and a request was made through National Resilience for the Fine Rescue Service to support the um, Greek civil protection. The, um, the idea of what was going to be done wasn't really known at the time. It was just to get a group of people, get a group of firefighters. They were, it was a, a sort of a, a disaster within the country of Greece and they needed assistance. They needed assistance with firefighting. Before mobilization, it wasn't really sure whether it, this was going to be working in the towns, working in the cities, because as you remember, the fire was actually burning within Athens or whether this was going to be remote wildland firefighting what the role was, wasn't really known. And again, before, as soon as we knew that we were sort of being stood up to go to Greece and uh, we were looking, so using the, the, the AFIS, using FIS, looking at the fires, getting the forecasts, looking, with, looking at the fire front footprints, taking a spot weather for areas, looking what the, the, the next 10 days weather looked like. If we were going to be out there, we wanted it to flow running. We didn't want to go there and then try to have to find all this information out. So this is the pre-planning stuff that we were trying to do. And then again, the considerations of how we were going, what we were going to do, how many people we could take, how we were going to get there, were we going to drive, were we going to fly? And within the, within the UK Fine Rescue Service, there is a, a UK ISAR mechanism, which, which is the UK Fire Service have a really good and long tradition of assisting other countries during disasters, normally natural disasters, earthquakes and, and the like. And um, they have all they have this mobilization mechanism ready to go at all time and his team stood up all time. So we were mobilized under that structure, which obviously sorted out all the insurance pre-deployment and everything. And the added problem this time was obviously COVID with the different COVID passports, different regulations and the understanding on all of that. It was what equipment we were going to take with us. So where were we taking firefighting tools or, would, or could they be provided? And, um, and were we taking drip torches? What, what do we need? And in the, in the end, this, because it was such a short duration before we mobilized, it was just boots and bags. We, we packed our bags and we got on a plane and we went. Um, again, it's really important. Greece isn't, uh, Greece is uh, a European country. There, there's food available, there's water available, but, Again, when you deploy to these countries, especially in the ISA mechanism, the firefighters who go are self-sufficient. So we had, we could have been self-sufficient when we hit the flow in Greece for 48 hours with food, etc. So we weren't going to become a burden onto the uh, the host fire and rescue service civil protection. So when we got there, our initial um, structure was we had a deployment commander and a deputy commander. We then had an inbuilt command support team with comms and we had 16 firefighting personnel from a number of UK fire and rescue services. And, and again, the role, once we hit the, hit the ground and we had a briefing and we were given a liaison officer, we, we, we discussed what we could achieve, what we could give. Everybody wants to go and fight 30 meter high flames and, and save, save properties and everything. But we, like I said, we hit the floor running and we had boots and bags, so we, we got together hand tools, we got together chainsaws, we got together your traditional dry firefighting tools, and we were tasked then with um, going into areas where the fire had passed through and mopping up. Now, it doesn't sound as exciting, but it's a really important task, and what that let the crews do, you think the Greek crews now have been fighting these fires for the last two to three weeks. They were physically and mentally exhausted. Fire engines were riding with two crews of two, 
they were really stretched. So that allowed, when 20 of us went onto the ground, it allowed them to step back, get a rest, but also redeploy, ready to fight new ignitions. Because even though there were some very large fires in Greece, the, the weather, they were still getting some large fires as well. So this was the, um, the command structure. So we had a um, bit of team leader, deputy team leader, and then we had non-scene commander. And then we, I acted as the role of wildfire tactical advisor. And with me were three other firefighters from South Wales Fire Service, part of our instructor team. And they then became the, the wildfire advisors for the teams that they were with. So we, we split into three teams because then we could constantly work. We were working 12 hours on, 12 hours off, but obviously in 40 degree heat, you can't work for 12 hours. So you've got to, you've got to revolve the teams, it's really important. And again, this is some of the stuff we were doing. This was in a, an olive grove and the fire had burned through and we were going in and just making sure that fire was out because when the midday sun was getting onto these areas, it was catching fire again and these fires were making runs daily. And every day we had, uh, we had a brief, I would brief the teams every day on what was happening, what we were going to be doing, the risks, where we were going to be, and, and it, really important the weather, and reminding people, hydration, get in the shade, rotate your crews, etc. really important stuff. And um, we, we were there, we were cut in line through um, the area on the left that burnt, the area on the right hadn't, and this is us just making line down to mineral soil, which... Again, it's not something, it's, this isn't traditional firefighting for UK firefighters. We, we generally use beaters or hose reels and the fires out. But these are things we have learned on a journey we have been on. And we, we are quite good at this now. Even in the South Wales Valleys, we can achieve this sort of task. I was very lucky. We have, uh, within South Wales, we have uh, uh, one of our watch managers in our headquarters. He's, he's a really good weather analyst. And I, I have about five different weather apps on my phone and I can look at them and they're always giving you different different weathers. And um, Colin, our weather guru, was he analyzes the weather charts. That's, that's above me. That's not part of my role. And he's looking at the weather charts and he's telling me it's going to be raining in Athens. And I'm telling the firefighters, telling the liaison officer there's a chance of rain. And they're like, no, no, we're all looking at the weather. And it's going to be dry. It's going to be very warm. And the, the photo you can see is the rain hit in Athens at 3 p.m., as the, our weather expert told us. So, again, this remote stuff can be really good because he did predict rain when we were, we were in the mountains and we did get rain. On, only a small amount, but again, it's really important, especially when you've got these cold fronts moving in and these different fronts. It's really important to know what the weather's going to be doing, and he was giving us that support. We, um, we were very fortunate. We borrowed a drone off um, the Sky TV crew who were following us. We uh, met up with the Sky TV crew and they, they came along with us and, and came to one of the areas we were working in. And we used their drone then. And then we were um, lent the drone from DJI, the company in Athens. They couriered a drone out to us and we had a drone with thermal capability so we could get on the fire ground early, identify the hotspots and get in there before these fires were making runs because they were making runs every afternoon. The photo you can see is, um, it's a, a village. You can see the, um, the smoke inversion. And we, as we were coming off the mountain one day at the end of our shift, this fire and another part of the fire we were on had made a run through the village. And um, you can see there, but aerial assets, even though there was helicopters, there were sky crane helicopters, there were umpteen helicopters, large aircraft, they couldn't drop water because the smoke inversion, they couldn't actually see where they were dropping the water again. So this is really important for people to realise that as we move on in the UK, as we move on across Northern Europe, it's not all about aircraft. You still need boots on the ground. You still need well-trained firefighters and you need a land management plan before these even fires happen. Putting all your trust into aircraft doesn't always work. It is important and it's really good at knocking down early start fires. But when these fires become huge, as they did, they then they lose their effectiveness. And it's important we, we learn that now before we start getting these very large fires in the UK. And you can see that's the area and that's the town. This is the area the next morning we went straight in and um, we were working 
walking around the properties, ensuring they were safe, ensuring the vegetation around them was out because there was still quite a lot of vegetation to burn. It was really important. And this is uh, this is one of the areas we went into, and you can just there was miles and miles of um, of this with uh, damaged property, destroyed properties, as you can see. And it, it's not a nice thing to see. And we were we when we were in areas, we were talking to communities and a bit of reassurance and. And I've got to be honest, they were all really grateful for what we were doing, which was really nice. So again, lessons learned then. So what did we learn from this deployment? Well, this is uh, the guys in yellow are from um, Germany. They, they traveled from Germany to fight the fires. They were actually in our wildfire conference in 2019 in Cardiff. I've worked with them. I've trained with them in Germany. And it's really important. It's about making your friends before you need them. And then you've got that shared idea and and you shared trust really and we all work together this is uh the german firefighters the french are in the bottom with the roll cages on the fire engines and again the the french drove they drove from uh, marseille and that was uh, a one day four hour drive and the the germans drove and that was a one day three hour drive and and we flew but in the future, and when we look to more resilience and we look towards training and these, these bigger networks where the UK now are learning and getting the skills to help these countries, and we've talked about this a long time, that when Northern Europe is on fire, generally early spring, early summer, the fires are not huge on the continent. But when they do become huge, we are generally then in our wetter season. So we, we can have the skills and we can have the resources to help our our uh, neighboring services and this is how long so again for us it was um, one day 11 hours so it's not a huge difference everything's all drive to Greece but again once you've got the plan you've got the resilience these things can be achieved and it's, it's nothing to say we couldn't do that in the future and again one one thing I did learn and um, the 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 Greek um, fire rescue service the Hellenic fire service they don't use fire to fight fires and um, it's something we have in working with lots of other countries we've developed this as a skill now tactical burning and we've trained other services within the uk and we are using this the videos you see in was us at the major incident in wareham forest there was 25 fire engines trying to put out the fire and we went in and used fire and burnt the fire to tracks and roads so then the fire and rescue service could just drive up and down and monitor these areas. They didn't have to be dragging hose into forestry every day. And then the forest, the forest catching fire again and making runs and jumping over these roads as it was. So we went in and we blacklined the whole fire. And that was, um, there were six of us did that from South Wales. So again, it's really effective. And that's where I think the, the Greeks can learn. And you could say the conditions are different, but at night the temperature does drop and things do change and you can make a difference by using these, these methods and we've done it in the past. Uh, this is um, the end of my presentation. It was a really rewarding opportunity and I think we've all learned a lot from it. And um, if you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them now and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Craig. Noel, uh, yes. keep your front through the questions there. There's a few yes, there. I have three questions here, Craig. I'll just take them in order. Uh, Val uh, Charlton has asked, uh, how much is commercial afforestation monoculture adding to the problem? And given the push for tree planting, do you think the management is sufficiently integrated into afforestation efforts? I think uh, what I saw in Greece, and again, is what what I've seen around the rest of the Southern Mediterranean is they have this migration of people. There's not a lot of people living in the countryside as there was, and there was a monoculture of um, pine. I don't really think it was commercial forestry, but I can see, I believe one of the people with their hands up is Zula, who's a Greek fire officer. So I'm sure she can explain that. So if you want to ask the next questions, and then maybe Zula will say something. Okay. Uh, the second question then was from Simona, um, and she asked about, uh, you mentioned that there's there had not been much wildfire damage to houses because of the construction materials. Would you still want fuel reduction around houses and gardens, creating a defensible space, or is it less important in your region? Uh, have you experienced any wildfire damage to, to houses, sheds, structures, etc.? 
Yeah, it's really important and it's something we are trying to get people to do. And we have a project within South Wales called Healthy Hillsides where we're man- trying to manage land in a different way. We need people to stop sort of throwing their garden waste over the garden fences, which is quite common in the areas we live. Mm-hmm. And understanding it, because of the weather patterns, we, we, we have a lot more rain than we have wildfire. But when we get wildfire, it does cause serious problems. And we need, we need people to start understanding really this risk. And yeah, we definitely need buffers around properties. Yeah. And the third question then from, Sa- from Simon Oldham. Um, you mentioned there's strategic resource of holding a helicopter on standby during the summer months in South Wales. Uh, what geographic area would that resource be expected to cover? Um, how common is that elsewhere in the UK? And who pays the bill for retaining that service? So the helicopter in, in it's an all Wales firefighting asset. So there's a helicopter, which is a private contractor, which is funded by Natural Resources Wales, which Natural Resources Wales is an amalgamation of the Environment Agency, the Forestry Commission and the Countryside Council of Wales. And the three, the three groups were amalgamated and they became Natural Resources Wales. So they pay for a helicopter to protect their forestry estate. So we have one helicopter on standby from the 1st of March to the 30th of September, okay. but then we can call on another one. And generally, we do use the helicopter every year, and we work closely with the helicopter firefighting teams, and we, we constantly involve in our tactics. Yeah. Um, I'll now call in uh, Zasula. Zasula, you wanted to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's really wonderful to see what you are doing. Uh, it's really wonderful that you are being prepared before uh, forest fires come to you. I mean, the big amount, the big uh, and very difficult fire behavior in your area. I think it's really important what what you are doing that you have been being prepared about all that. Uh, this summer we had in fire, fire season 2001 was one of our worst uh, fire seasons we ever handled and with a very extreme uh, fire behavior uh, forest fires. Uh, I want to thank Greg uh, for the presentation. It's very uh, good for us to have a feedback about how uh, fire season was uh, in Greece uh, seems to you and what was uh, the problems, the suggestions you have to do uh, with us uh, and I want to thank all the people who came and helped us because I think the most important thing is to work all together uh, because in disasters nobody is alone in disasters we are all together and we must do something about it that's all I have to say and really thank you for the invitation. Okay. I see uh, D- John Pretty. John, do you have a question? Your hand's still up there. Oh, is it? Apologies. Yeah. I'll take it down. Okay. Uh, well, if, unless anyone else has any, any other questions, uh, we we'll move Matthew, on. Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, Craig, thank you very much. That was that was really interesting, excellent, very inspiring actually as well. Just coming back to your point, I thought it was very pertinent about make friends before you need them. And I see at the moment that that's very much in the fire community. Um, and uh, what David was saying about this, there's been some huge progress. Uh, we need that in the land manager's side as well. And what we're seeing is that, let's refer to Northern Ireland where I am, is that there are some now really good strategic reports being done on uh, land management of areas that are going to be vulnerable, uh, big open upland areas, and a lot of them peatland, really important habitat. But the thing that I see is that you know we need more of that working together of land managers to see how we're going to take this forward. And hopefully, then the the, the upcoming strategy that will be for Northern Ireland will help you know uh, fund that and pull people together. But I think just as you're doing in the uh, fire um, response community in, in, in the firefighting community. We also need it in the land managers as well, Craig. So I would like, let's just say that, that that's something that really needs to move forward, sharing that experience of what we're doing. I totally agree working with FRS and also land managers together. That's the importance. And I know you work together in Northern Ireland and our Healthy Hillsides project. We're bringing, bringing organisations together with the common theme of fire, which hasn't really been done before. And that's Trying to get fire on the agenda in some of these northern European countries is really difficult, as you're aware, because it is such a 
a small issue, but when it becomes an issue and you haven't got no fire engines left, it becomes a very big issue. And it's about these year-round solutions to seasonal problems. It's, it's, it's really important. Okay, Ed, uh, Jim will now introduce our next speaker. Yes, and just want to keep keep moving here, Craig. Thank you very much thank for you. that and for all your all your uh, all the, the questions as well. Casey, if you're uh, ready, thank you very much. Casey is uh, the fire well, fire management analyst with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and you're going to give us an overview of um, the the season. Uh, looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Casey. Hi, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess looks like everything's working on my end. So hopefully on your end. Yep. Uh, my name is Casey yep. Pesky, and I'm a fire management analyst at the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. Um, it's currently eight in the morning here. So uh, I've had a little coffee, so I hope I don't talk too fast for you all. Anyway, uh, my day job, I do a lot of data analyses uh, using remote sensing, GIS, and databases. And then uh, during the fire season, I spend a lot of time out in the field helping fire managers make decisions and decision support. So my background is operations and I've, I've kind of uh, turned into an analyst at this point. So, so today, what I wanted to kind of get to is um, the intended outcome of, of all these discussions is learning and what can we learn from the different areas that are being talked about as we all move forward in the face of uh, changing climates. Um, this isn't a Western US problem. This isn't a UK problem. This is a, a global issue and uh, fires have repercussions on many things. Um, insurance, fatalities, um, impacts on resources, costs to different programs. So today we'll talk about some of those things and uh, hopefully we have time for questions. So as others have mentioned, um, the climate is changing. Well, I'll be talking about the Western US today. What I want to show is that um, the, the lengths of the seasons are changing. We, we're seeing bigger fires in our recent history. They're burning longer. They're causing more damage than before. But as people have said, it's the way that they're burning that is actually changing. It's the intensity, it's the timing, it's the season. Um, that whole fire environment is changing. And we have research that shows that. In the Western US, we're seeing an increase of almost 90 days uh, currently compared to the 1970s. And globally, research is showing um, almost 30 days since the late 1970s. And other weather variables are also changing. Don't freak out about this slide, I'll break it down. Um, it's basically showing areas that are getting hotter, drier, and windier. And all you have to notice is the amount of red on the map. So we have the two columns. On the left are areas with uh, significant trends in annual fire weather variables. And on the right, areas with a change in the frequency of anomalous weather conditions that are severe. So severe weather events. So we have temperature across the top, relative humidity on the second line, uh, rain-free days is the zero PCP line, and then increased wind speeds. And again, don't freak out, you're just looking at that red area. But you can see uh, the Western US is really highlighted, but there are many places that we're talking about today as well. Um, this is so important. We have a, an index that we can look at when we're uh, trying to understand some of our information and make plans. Uh, this hot, dry, windy index is out there. It's experimental at this time. But when you think about it, when we consider that fire triangle of fuels and weather and topography, these longer seasons with hotter, drier, and windier conditions are gonna have an impact on fire behavior, fire spread, and ultimately fire effects. And if we look at our annual accounting of fire sizes and the numbers, part of that picture is revealed. Um, we've got fires in gray and acres or hectares, I guess you could translate it loosely um, by that black line. Some would argue that we're, uh, having larger fires and burning more area than we have in the past. Some would argue that fires are just being reintroduced on their own terms to a landscape that's now primed to burn. Uh, so it doesn't matter the side that you're gonna take on this. The fact is that the numbers of fires isn't necessarily changing, but the area burned and when and how those fires are burning is what is changing. And I think a couple of us have already alluded to that this morning. 
Um, for comparison on some of the fires that we're talking about on the Western US, we also have lots of fires, but uh, the scale of the fires that are making the news and global headlines these days are really big. I, we have uh, overlaid a couple of different fires for comparison here on Belfast, um, on the left, the August complex, and on the right, the Cameron Peak fire. Um, these are both from last year, but uh, fires this year have burned similarly. And in fact, over the last 20 years, we're seeing large fires like this pretty regularly across the landscape. Um, this is the 10 largest fires in California over the last 20 years as of mid-July this year, compared to the size of San Francisco, which is about uh, 12,000 hectares. And that's that gray box that's shown in each of these uh, burned areas from these fires. So what's notable about these fires is that in the Western US, they burn for a long time, sometimes multiple months, and they're burning these large areas during different times of the year. They're starting to burn through the night in more intense ways than they may have in the past. Um, and the intertwined connections of, of the different complexities that are impacting things these days is what we're really gonna be talking about. Um, resource availability is impacted. We're having smoke impacts, not only locally near the fires, but also nationally and globally from these large fires. Uh, urban interface is being impacted and in some cases completely destroyed by these fires. Uh, the lack of suppression has caused the fuels complex to change. And with that comes intense uh, intensity changes, which impacts the landscape in the future. We've got ecological impacts, hydrological impacts, carbon cycle impacts that we need to be thinking about. So as I back up to our, our main goal here of talking about fires in the Western US, our typical super general overview of how fire season moves is as we transition out of spring prescribed burning and agricultural burning in the Southeast, uh, we start to see fires appearing in the Southwest and Southern California. It starts to move North throughout the summer and uh, fires start appearing in these different geographic areas. Um, as a monsoon start coming in the mid July, the Southwest goes out and then the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain disappear. And by the end of September, typically the Northwest and Northern Rockies are, are not in the picture. This year we had a little bit of a, a different story. Uh, we had this, the typical transition out of the spring burning season. The Southwest and California came into play. We had a little bit of fire in the Great Basin and a little bit in the Rocky Mountains, but that stuff was over mostly by June. And then Minnesota uh, came on the radar. And Minnesota does have a fire season, but it's not as regular as most of the stuff in the West. It's on a different uh, frequency. And so with that in play, as well as the typical rest of the country as it starts burning, uh, we had a completely different um, landscape this summer. Here's, here's a map of what the fires look like um, sometime in August, I can't remember the date, but there's a lot of fire across the Western US. And part of the issue coming into fire season this year is that we're coming into fire season with a drought. You'll notice those areas in dark red and um, the red to dark red, those are extreme to severe drought. And again, the Great Basin didn't really burn, mostly because it was in drought. So those fine fuels didn't really show up and allow fires to spread. So we did get starts, but just not large fires in those areas. And these headlines, we're seeing them everywhere, but it kind of says it all. The Southwest drought is a preview of coming attractions. This is a map of what uh, the drought looked like at the end of August, 2021. Across the bottom, you can see a graph that shows uh, the proportion of the Southwest that was in different categories of drought since 2000. And if you start looking at a graph like this across much of the Western US, you, you'd start seeing some interesting patterns. And I, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's probably uh, the same in many different areas of the world as these climates start changing. Um, we also in our, as we think about what we're talking about with the Western US, we have these large fires, it's really impacting resources. We use preparedness levels to describe where we're at in our fire season in terms of fire activity and the number of resources. These are increments of planning and organizational uh, readiness that are dictated by burning conditions, fire activity, and resource availability. So as the season drags on, we typically start at one in the early season and by the, the dirty August, as we call it, and I'll show you why, um, 
we're, we're at preparedness level five many times. So we started this season in June, as we typically do in preparedness level two. Um, this is data since 1990, the year 2021 is in the last column. And you can see that by mid-June, we're in preparedness level three. And by the end of June, we're at preparedness level four. Going into July, um, halfway through July, we pop into preparedness level five. The entirety of August for 2021 was in preparedness level five. And as you can see, there's also many other years in the past 30 years that have um, been in preparedness level four or five, which is why we call it Dirty August. And by the end of September, um, mid to late September, we're back down to a preparedness level four and then to a preparedness level three. Um, so over the course of the season, we had 99 days at preparedness level four or above, and 69 of those were at preparedness level five. Uh, the climate and the weather, those things impact us, but these large fires, these long duration fires impacts resources. We only have a handful of um, large fire management teams that can handle these more complex fires. Typically those type one and type two teams manage those um, type one events, those large fire events. And we have 51 of those uh, type one and two teams combined. That's a lot of people. They get rotated onto these assignments for two to three weeks at a time. And um, then they rotate out for R&R &R days off to rest and recuperate. At many times this summer, we had all the teams out or on R&R. &R, and it was the same with crews, engines, helicopters, every kind of firefighting resource out there. So we were pretty stretched then. Um, by the end of July, we had 108 incidents, large incidents that were making the reports with 22,000 people assigned and 32 type one and two teams. By mid-August, we were up to 110 incidents with 26,000 people assigned, 34 type one and two teams. By the end of August, we're back down to 87 large fires, but we still had 25,000 people assigned and 29 type one and two teams. So the impacts of these large fires is, is pretty impressive. Uh, we have confounding factors that are influencing things, um, especially this year, COVID, um, in terms of lingering effects from last year, uh, implemented policies and, and new things, new ways of doing things this year. Um, it impacts resource availability. We have um, increase in population moving into those urban interfaces. The climate's changing. We're having longer seasons. It's impacting our smoke. Um, we're having nighttime burning um, and poor relative humidity recoveries and vapor pressure deficits that are impacting things. Fuels accumulation due to fire suppression um, also impacts the, the health of those fuels. And then a lot of social issues, um, mental health, firefighter pay disparities and things like that, that confound some of these things. So it's a big picture. Those are the things that are making the news. You can see them all here. Um, people move into fire risky areas, COVID, uh, lack of resources. So as I said, COVID's impacts are lingering. They're gonna to continue to impact us as different policies are implemented. Uh, fire crews were impacted, whole crews and teams were impacted by exposures and quarantine and isolation requirements this year. Um, as we roll out new policies and vaccines and whatnot, that it, we're not gonna get into the politics of all that, but it is going to factor into resource shortages, response levels, preparedness levels and, and whatnot. Um, the urban interface is a big issue. The urban interface is expanding. The populations are expanding. We need to be thinking about how we're planning these areas. Um, COVID really had an impact on that. Uh, people started moving into these, these recreational Western areas to get away from the big cities. Uh, this is a map of fires since 2010. Those orange and red areas are large fires since 2010. And those also happen to be the places that people are moving to. So as we move you know, into the, the future, the, with human-caused fires being a, a large number of our fires, this is really going to be an interesting scenario to play out. Uh, the smoke impacts, like I said, um, this is just one shot from July 20th of this year and the impact of the Southern Oregon and Northern California wildfires on the smoke uh, across the country and indeed globally. Um, we had reports of some of these smoke plumes making it around the world twice. 
Nighttime firefighting is uh, increasing. The fires are burning longer into the night and the tactics that we might have normally used may not be as effective if those fires are burning as intensely through the night as they have been. And then the fuels story. The successful suppression tactics that we've had over the past hundred years have really caused issues with our fuels. Um, we've got an increased fuels matrix. We've got thicker and more continuous fuels. This example shows a Douglas fir uh, regrowth over 25 years in Washington. And if we have a lack of uh, fire or a lack of fuels treatments in places like this, then the, the hazard and risk is definitely going to increase. Um, but that is one part of the fire triangle that we can control. We can implement monitoring practices in conjunction with fuels treatments to reduce the risk of undesirable fire effects and fire behavior and potentially increase some of the tactical advantages of the crews on the landscape and indeed improve the resiliency of the landscape. And it doesn't matter how those treatments are done. We can have biological controls like grazing, um, mechanical thinning and, and uh, forestry treatments or prescribed fires in any combination. And the idea is to get in and break up that fuels continuity so that we can have a positive impact in the long term. And to do that, we're gonna need policies and funding, um, training and personnel, and all that needs to be implemented to be successful. And then lastly, those social issues that I briefly mentioned, um, lots of pay disparity between different types of fire departments and fire agencies, pro public and private. Um, we've got these longer fire seasons having an impact. These long seasons, large campaign fires, they're stressful on families, they're um, causing mental health issues for firefighters and we really need to um, be paying attention to that and understanding how, how to deal with that and help our, our boots on the ground. And then you don't need to read this whole thing. I'm happy to share this uh, presentation with anybody, but I, I saw this the other day as I was putting this together and it's a, a call to action essentially of basically we must address ecology and firefighter mental health. Um, all this stuff is coming together. What we're seeing, we haven't seen in the past. Uh, we're, we're having changing climates. We have all these interconnecting factors that are implement, um, impacting fire seasons. It's not just in the US, it's gonna be an impact everywhere. Um, make your friends before you need them and let's use these ah. kind of com um, conferences and, and, um, and whatnot to have discussions around these, these different uh, topics and ideas and, and come together with solutions and new ideas of ways to move forward. So with that, that's what I have. And I, I guess I'll just leave you with a brief little video of how fire actually moves around the US and how much we actually have um, in the Southeast and the Eastern um, and mid country, you can see a lot of prescribed fire and agricultural burning in the spring. And then as we start to get into the summer seasons, uh, you can start to see some of those fires start popping up um, pretty intensely along the, the West Coast and then up into the Northern latitudes there. So um, with that, that's what I had to kind of overview. It's not what did we learn, but things to think about as we move forward so we can learn from them. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Casey. Uh, I have one question in the chat room from, uh, from Jim Bradley. And uh, while I'm asking that, if anyone else has any other questions, if you'd raise your hand through the reactions icon at the bottom of the screen. Jim's question, Casey, is what are the changes in land management in the Western United States? And how is that impacting on wildfire frequency? Yeah, so we have, our land use has changed. Like I've said, the um, people are moving into those, those uh, forested and, and areas outside the city. So uh, some of our, our land use has changed in that. In terms of land management, uh, that, that varies. We, in the federal agencies, we're able to do a lot of uh, treatments, fuels treatments, but there's a lot of red tape around those when people get involved because they don't want smoke in their area. Um, and stuff like that. So in some instances, we're able to actually treat to prevent or um, help help the landscapes be resilient to some of these fires. But in, in other instances, policies prevent that. States are supposed to put out fires. So there's a lot of work right now trying to get uh, private burners certified to burn 
you know, on their lands and some of those state policies to change so that we can start implementing prescribed fire practices in order to prevent some of this stuff. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Simon Oldham. How common is it to buy insurance cover for fire damage? And is that still available now with our change in climate? Yeah, so the insurance industry is actually really picking up on this. Um, the the fires in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s really caused them to open their eyes because of the amount of damages that they were starting to see. Um, so they're really actually at a forefront of a lot of the, the modeling on the, <laughs> on the fire um, spread and potential and risk and, and stuff like that. Um, so yes, that's a big player these days. I'm not exactly sure all the policies out there. Um, it's definitely not necessarily required, but there is insurance available out there for homeowners. Okay, and uh, another question from Mark Hammond. Um, who was the modeling information about wildfire risk re reported to? Is it communicated to land managers, the public or government organizations? Yeah, there's, that's a great question. Uh, we have what we call fire exchanges and they're basically collaborations between uh, federal and state governments as well as private, such as um, universities, for example. Mm -hmm. And we try to push that kinds of information out there. There are lots of efforts with um, the availability of web-based mapping to see the wildfire risk at different areas. And so many states are starting to adopt those kinds of things. And so the, the risk is known in a lot of instances by the fire departments, whether that's a structural or a wildland fire department, mm -hmm. and the information is available out there. Um, but the reporting is, you know, there's just because there's a risk doesn't mean something okay. will necessarily be done about it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's all the questions from the chat room. If there are no more questions um, from anyone, we'll hand back to Jim just to Okay. Before the break. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Casey. And, and can I take the opportunity to thank all three of the presenters? Those were wonderful and very different uh, presentations, give a, give a lot of food for thought. Um, just a couple of particular points. Um, we're going to swap around the two presentations in session two. Uh, that's particularly because um, our colleagues in South Africa may have a an electricity supply problem at a particular time. So we're going to get um, Lyndon Pronto first, if that's okay, Lyndon, and uh, then, then Dean. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I think we'll just uh, a little bit early, but uh, let's have that comfort break and let's meet back here, maybe a little bit before um, 3.40, maybe closer to 3.35. Um, we'll stay on here, but... Um, We'll, we'll put, put everything on mute and we'll see you back there here on, on 10 minutes. But again, thanks to everybody involved and see you back here. Uh, in the interim, actually, could you again use the chat to make any suggestions uh, in terms of themes, uh, and anything that's come out of the, the, the last three talks, for instance, that would be useful in terms of setting the, uh, setting the topics and themes for uh, the conference next year. Thank you very much. Okay, and I think you'll get a chance to talk to I can put further questions to the three speakers if we can hold on to them to the uh, to the very end of the plenary session at the at the end. But listen, we'll see you at three thirty, three thirty five or three forty, so roughly. We'll have an informal um, uh, feedback then. Okay, thank you very much. Stay on the line. There's no problem.